So um, I'm just going to say a few words then um, just to, uh, to give you some background on the LJC. Um, if there's anybody out there that this is a, their new event, uh, their, their first event, sorry, with the LJC, um, especially for those tuning in afterwards, um, we're getting a lot more now from, from overseas. So, so yeah, a bit of big background and a bit of a uh, call to action. Um, so firstly, if you are new to it, uh, we are the London Java Meetup Group. Uh, we are a, uh, a very well established now, 13 years old uh, and highly active group. Uh, so we've got just over 7,500 members and um, pushing 600 events now. Um, but what's, what's bigger than that with the LJC is, is what's beyond the numbers, which is around the, the values that we have, that the, the power of community can really be bigger than, than us working in as, as individuals. Um, and that, that covers a broad range of areas. So firstly, and, and the bit, I guess where, where I specialize, the learning and development side of things, events like this evening. We've had these 600 events. They're all uh, evidence of how if we all pull together as individuals, we can learn uh, much quicker. We do a lot of other things around, around mentoring and, and, and groups within that. Um, also within tech, initiatives like Adopt, uh, Adopt a JSR, Adopt Open JDK, they came from the, the LJC events and, and, and meetings within that. And more recently, uh, focusing on diversity and inclusion and things around uh, the systemic racism, um, gender diversity and issues that, that are out there within the tech community. We're seeing what we can do by pulling together as a community to, to tackle some of those. Uh, so as for who I am, um, again, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Barry Cranford. Um, I am a, uh, I'm not a developer, I'm a recruiter. Um, I, I run a recruitment company called RecWorks, which many of you will know. Um, and here at RecWorks, we see recruitment, we, we believe it can be a force for good beyond just getting people jobs within the industry. Um, just seeing some horrendous typos there, so forgive me for those. Um, and what, that, uh, what that, that, that means to us is we see our workers sitting somewhere between uh, giving back to people that we've worked with and, and paying forward to people that we hope to work with. Um, so that involves building these communities, running the events, um, and, and making mentor introductions. Uh, we drive a lot of the values within the, the community um, that I just talked about, and, and we're constantly looking at, at new ideas and initiative, initiatives that, that we can run within that. Uh, so some of those initiatives that we've started recently are around aspiring speakers, uh, aspiring CTOs, aspiring interim CTOs, and, and various other things like that. So come and talk to me if, if you're interested in getting involved in any of this, whether it's diversity and inclusion, uh, speaking at events, um, mentoring other people, setting, getting, getting ready to be a speaker, anything like that, then come and see me on either LinkedIn or follow me on uh, Twitter. Um, it's all powered by recruitment. Uh, so we don't make any money from any of the community work that we do. Uh, all the money that, that, that powers all this comes from, uh, from getting people jobs. So if you're looking to hire, um, or, or you're looking to, to find a new role yourself, then always come and see us. Uh, so on to this evening then, uh, and tonight, which is uh, with, with Dave Farley um, on optimizing continuous delivery. So for those of you that, that don't know Dave, he's the founder and director of Continuous Delivery Limited. Um, he's a thought leader in uh, the field of continuous delivery, uh, DevOps and software development in general, uh, the co-author of the Jolt award-winning book, Continuous Delivery, and a regular conference speaker and well-known blogger. Um, so with that, Dave and Rico, I'll, I'll hand back to you, uh, to yourselves. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, right, so, so, so welcome everybody. Um, the, the topic for this evening is to talk about optimizing continuous delivery. And I'm gonna warn you in advance, I've got 75 slides and I'm gonna whiz through them quite quickly, some of them at least. Um, but the idea of this talk is really to talk to people that are kind of familiar with the ideas of continuous delivery and are living with it. And, and where, do you, where do you take it from there? How, how do you, you know, what, what does this mean to, uh, as, a, as an approach, a process to live with? Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, about some of those ideas. So let me just share my screen and switch to the presentation and then we can start going. So there we are and switch to the appropriate window. Right, can everybody, can some, can people see my, um, my, my, my presentation? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, let me try that again. Yes, we see them. Okay. And 
there can you see the optimizing continuous delivery yep good right i'll start then so uh, continuous delivery it's it's a pro it's a process of, but my favorite way to talk about this is that we're trying to optimize to ensure that our software is always in a releasable state so we're going to develop we're going to approach development in a way where we're kind of keeping the software releasable all of the time and whatever it takes to achieve releasability is really our focus and our scope so let's start with what's kind of the basics. What, what, what can we imagine as the kind of the yeah, uh, absolute fundamentals? What's the starting point of a deployment pipeline, for example? So we're going to have some developers working on some code. They're going to commit the code to a version control system. We're going to evaluate that very quickly and get fast feedback. I generally advise customers to get feedback in under five minutes and achieve a high level of confidence that if everything else, if if it passes this stage, everything else is going to be good. We're going to, this, the end of a commit stage is to achieve a releasable thing, some, some artifact, a deployable unit of software of some form. And we're going to, um, sorry, uh, we're going to store that and, and, and move forward. We're also going to evaluate, so, so that kind of gives us a technical evaluation of the, of the quality of our software. Does the software do what I as a developer think the software is supposed to do. We then need to evaluate it from another, another perspective. We also need to determine whether the software fulfills the need that the user perceives. So we'd like to be able to test it and evaluate it from the perspective of an external user of the system. So we're gonna write some automated tests that evaluate it from the perspective of an external user of the system in lifelike scenarios in a production-like test environment. And that for me, and, and, and then we'd like to be able to, if all of that's good, we'd like to be able to deploy it in production. That for me is what I think of as the kind of minimal deployment pipeline. I can't imagine writing any software that doesn't have those pieces in it. The ability to automate the deployment, the ability to evaluate from the perspective of a user and the evaluator and, and technical evaluation. So if I was writing kind of some, something fairly trivial, for my mom's cake shop, I'd build a deployment pipeline like this. Uh, and that would be the scope of it. Uh, if, I wanted to if I wanted to take that further, if I was building something more complicated, there might be other things that were required in order for me to achieve this idea of a releasable outcome. I might want to, I'm not going to do any manual regression testing ever. I'm going to automate all of that. But I might want to do exploratory manual testing to see if the software is nice to use and those sorts of things. I might want to do performance testing, security testing, scalability testing, data migration, any of those sorts of things. Why don't, you know, compliance evaluation, whatever it takes to achieve a releasable outcome. And maybe that's the scope of my deployment pipeline. So the key idea here is that deployment pipeline goes from commit to releasable outcome. That's what we're trying to achieve. So uh, the next thing to think about in that context is what's the correct scope for a deployment pipeline? And I think this is something that I see lots of people make mistakes over. So here's a system. Here's a system. What, what kind of, what's a deployable unit here? What, what's the scope of, of evaluation of this system? Could I work on one of the pieces of this system and sensibly know whether I'm done and whether that piece, that piece of the system is finished? And I can't really, this is the real thing. This is the, this is the deployable outcome. This is the complete thing, the, tr the, the, the releasable outcome that I'm trying to achieve. There are other kinds of systems that are you know, made up of different pieces, but this is what we would think of as an independently deployable unit. In this case, an independently deployable unit of aeroplane, but we're usually more interested in independently deployable units of software. But other kinds of systems, we could think of systems like this that are a bit more flexible, a bit more composable in terms of what makes a deployable unit. We could configure each of these things could be independently deployable, but they still combine together to form a system. And I think that's a key idea. This idea of, of using the deployability of a system to determine the scope of evaluation. 
which is really what a deployment pipeline is about. If we're going from commit to releasable outcome, it means we need to answer all of the questions in the scope of that evaluation to get to releasability. So for example, if you are building a microservice and you have a deployment pipeline that, that goes to the, con the conclusion of, the, of that service, you don't really get to test that service with other services to see whether you can then go further and release into production. The deployment pipeline is supposed to do the, all, all of that evaluation for you. And that's a level of complexity that people sometimes miss in terms of thinking of these things. So we, we, the scope of a deployment pipeline that's worth thinking about is an independently deployable unit of software. And if you, if you stick by that rule, even if that's tough to achieve, that simplifies an awful lot of problems, specifically an awful lot of dependency management problems that tend to raise their head if you don't stick to that kind of rule. So moving on, uh, for, org for organizations and people and teams that have worked with deployment pipelines for a little while, it, it rapidly becomes a strategic resource. If we are using our deployment pipeline to evaluate all changes to our production system, which is generally the advice that I offer the people that I work with, then that means that this is the only channel to production. We're going to automate everything in terms of the configuration, the, the, the changes to the code itself, the deployment of those things, everything. Uh, the infrastructure, all of those things are going to be automated and evaluated within the scope of a deployment pipeline. So as this is the only channel to production, that means that if we break it, if that prevents, uh, that eliminates our ability to go into production. And so it's quite serious. Right, so the kinds of problems that we might see in our deployment pipeline um, are these. We could have a slow commit stage and the commit stage is this kind of crucial step in our ability to release change into production, giving us that technical evaluation. We could have a slow acceptance test stage where we're running these much more complicated, uh, more difficult to, to, to make efficient acceptance tests, deploying the system in lifelike test environments and evaluating it in lifelike circumstances. We could have failing tests that are causing a problem and getting in the way of the visibility. One of the other ways in which I sometimes talk about deployment pipelines is that there are, there are falsification mechanism. The idea is, is that if a test fails, that prevents us from releasing change into production, uh, and we discard that release candidate at the point at which the test fails. So failing tests are, are something to take very seriously. Um, we might have intermittent tests and then, then now we're getting really mixed signals about, about what's going on. We don't really know what state we're in and whether we should be releasing or not. Um, and there are changes to the pipeline itself, which may put the, the, the pipeline itself is a reasonably sophisticated piece of software and we can make changes to it and, and destabilize it very easily. So if we're, if we're trying to defend that and protect that uh, because it's such a strategic resource, how do we cope with those sorts of changes? So the rest of my talk is kind of broken into these five bits and we'll, we'll kind of go through each of those in a little bit more detail. So let's think about slow commit stage. The commit stage is focused, as I said, on the kind of the technical evaluation of our software. Does the software do what I as a developer or a development team think the software is supposed to be doing? It's usually composed of these sorts of steps or similar kinds of steps to these. If we've got a language that requires compilation like Java, we're going to compile something, we're going to run a bunch of unit tests, we're probably going to run a bunch of analysis tests as well, encoding our, um, uh, failing the build on, our, on, on, on not meeting our coding standards, that kind of thing. And at the end of the commit stage, our job is to build a deployable unit of software, a, the installers for our system, a jar file or um, a, a, a docker image or, or a war file or something like that. So 
our ideal feedback cycle for this is under five minutes. That's in order to optimize the process at the human level so that we as developers can work very quickly, commit a small change, get valuable, fast, high quality feedback, and then move on to something new while the rest of the deployment pipeline runs. If it takes longer than five minutes, we're probably not going to wait for the change or we're going to we're going to bundle up more changes and be tempted to co uh, commit bigger, more complicated things to the pipeline, which kind of compromises our ability to move quickly and experiment in small, safe steps. So five minutes is kind of important. I would argue that this is the, the most valuable feedback cycle in the pipeline. So, so it's, 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 it's kind of about ship, you know, the, the, the terminology, which I'm, I'm not a great fan of, but the, the terminology is kind of shifting left. But the, the, the principle here is that we want to fail fast. If I could get all of the results for all of my automated tests, security tests, performance tests, as a red, squig red squiggly line in my IDE, I would take that. That would be wonderful. But I don't know how to do that. So the deployment pipeline is about trying to optimize to get the feedback, the most important feedback as quickly as I can. So I'm going to use the design of my software to get red squiggly lines. I'm going to use the, the static typing of languages like Java and stuff like that to, to be my friend and help me spot errors in my design. But then after that, I'm going to use the commit stage and continuous integration, which is really what the commit stage is about. Um, to get that fast and high quality feedback about, about the nature of my change and whether my change works along, along with my teammates' changes. So this is crucial and this is well worth spending a time, money, effort, whatever it takes to make this fast and efficient. So the first thing that could go wrong in the commit stage is compilation. Maybe your builds are slow. I don't know why it is, but my experience as a consultant going into other people's organizations and trying to help them do some of this stuff, it seems to me sometimes as though we software developers take our brains out of gear when it comes to certain kinds of jobs. And build scripts is one. We, we might be brilliant software developers who really take design seriously and really think about the modularity and separation of concerns in, the, in, in our implementations. And then we write a big ball of mud spaghetti monstrosity as our build script. And I don't know why that is. So apply the same kind of thinking to build scripts as we would to any other piece of software. Make them nice and easy to read make them modular, make them composable, make them efficient, work to make those things um, you know, work on your behalf. If it comes to it, compilation, buy faster hardware. I once worked for a trading company and their big problem was a, a very large C++ build. And at some point after we'd done what we could to optimize the, the compilation stage, I went to my boss and say, I'd like, can you give me $100,000 so I can buy some big servers, please? And fortunately, they were res relatively wealthy, so they did. And that allowed us to go an awful lot faster with that build. It's worth investing in this. You might not want to spend that much money on hardware, but buying faster hardware can help. Parallelize the build. Um, a, a build a modern build systems are, 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 are good at parallelizing things and think about the ways in which you can you can use that par that parallelization uh, uh, to your advantage it's not always easy but certainly things like the, the gradle build system will do some quite clever things in terms of parallelizing your efforts with J with java builds on quite a large scale um, Decompose the system into smaller modules or services. Now, this is kind of often the first thing that people do, and it's not where I would necessarily start because it's, it's quite a complicated thing to get right. And as soon as you start doing this, the danger is, is that you get into the problem of a dependency management, which is a world-class hard problem, and that's not really where you want to spend your time. So this is worth thinking about if this is if this is what you must do, 
but I would I, I consciously left this to later in my description of things to look at um, because it's a complicated solution. It's not a simple solution. <laughs> I, I forgot that I had this in the slide. It's not as easy as it first seems, although it's what everybody wants to do. Dependency management, I suggest my, my, my kind of slight, slightly, it's slightly a joke, but it's slightly true, is that there are only two hard things in computer science. One of them is concurrency and the other one's dependency management. But those two things are world-class hard. That those are, you know, up there kind of with quantum physics difficulty almost. Now, this is really difficult stuff. Microservices is no silver bullet. I see too many teams that think that, that microservices manage, magically allow you to ignore dependency management, and that's not true. The idea of independently deployable units is a good, is a good one and a powerful one to think about and to, to employ. Moving on. So the other thing to do is to look at, oops, sorry, press the button too fast. The other thing to think about is to uh, look at modern build systems. Um, Gradle, Bazel, Book. Uh, Bazel is the, uh, the Google uh, build system. Book is the Facebook build system. Uh, all three of these are quite par powerful at parallelization. And uh, in, in terms of Bazel and Book, they will do parallelization across heterogeneous builds, quite complicated builds. Um, I'm a big fan of Gradle for, for Java projects myself because it's very opinionated and it will just work very simply, but it's also incredibly powerful. You can tune it to in a lot of clever ways to get very fast incremental builds and, uh, and distributed builds using these sorts of technologies. One of the tricks that I have used, it, to be honest, I've not used it on a big Java build. I haven't needed to because Java's, Java's a bit more friendly to this kind of stuff. But on other kinds of builds, one of the tricks that I've used is to build from RAM disk. Often builds, particularly builds with languages that use many small files, are I.O. bound. And so moving, moving first from, from uh, kind of conventional hard disk to SSD is a good step. But putting it all in RAM is even faster. RAM's, RAM's still faster than an SSD. And so that can get you that can get you a few percentage points of improvement in build systems, sometimes more than that, if you are really struggling. The next thing that can be slow uh, after compilation, after we've looked to optimize that, is testing. And the first piece of advice here is look to the tests. Um, it's it's nearly always badly written tests. If you are right, if you have slow unit tests, there's something seriously wrong with your unit testing because unit tests aren't slow. Mostly, if you are doing, if you're following the rules of kind of test driven development style approach to, to, to automated testing, test first, your tests are going to be in process right alongside the code that you're evaluating and you can run thousands of those kinds of tests in, 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 in seconds. Um, they take, you know, each test will take microseconds to run literally for those kinds of things. So you can have lots of those. So if your tests are slow, there's something going on and it's worth looking into. Commit tests should mostly be pure unit tests. Don't start the application, don't write to disk, don't write to the database, don't use the network, don't, and fake all external dependencies. Then you can have these pure unit tests that you can execute thousands, hundreds of thousands in very short periods of time. Uh, and so look to rework those tests. Except, accept slow tests grudgingly. The commit stage is named the commit stage rather than the unit test stage because as well as getting very fast feedback, we're also trying to achieve a high level of confidence that our changes are good. I generally advise my, my, my clients that what they're looking for from a commit stage is feedback in under five minutes and about an 80% level of confidence that if all of those tests pass, everything else is going to be okay. And so there are some kinds of tests that you need in a commit stage in order to achieve the second of those, the, the higher level of confidence. Some kinds of tests that aren't necessarily uh, unit tests. 
I can remember when we built um, our exchange at, at Elmax, we had the, the nastiest, ugliest, slowest, most painful test in our commit stage was a test to check that our spring configuration worked correctly. We had to load up the whole spring configuration just to see whether the wiring was correct. It's one of the things I disliked about spring in those days was that the configuration was in XML and it was just too easy to make a typo in the XML and you didn't find out until runtime that it was broken. So we wrote some tests around this stuff. They took, they took about two minutes, as I recall, to run all of those out of an entire commit stage that only took four minutes. So we ran them in parallel with other things, but even so they were unpleasant, but they caught a really common failure case, uh, you know, a typo in some XML. And so it was worth doing. So there is a place on occasion for slow tests, but really accept them grudgingly and be, you know, really work hard to try and find out how, how you can get, get away without, not, without having those slow tests. Always think about efficiency when writing tests. One of my tricks for that is the idea of chicken counting. I don't know if you've ever come across that term, but uh, we, used to talk, we used to talk about this in the olden days of, of, of kind of thinking about design. Um, is, is a chicken counting, the, the joke is that chickens only can count, have three levels of counting, zero, one, and many. And software developers should be the same. You know, zero, one, and many, that's, that's how you implement code. So if you've got a test that takes zero things, that's easy, because it's not much of a test. If it takes one thing, it's easy to evaluate that very quickly. If you've got, if you've got many things, then many is, I usually count three as many. So, so my, any test that has any loop in it or any, any number of things, I'm going to evaluate that three times. You're never going to see me write a test that has a loop of more than three. If, you know, if, I'm, if I'm writing code that, that evaluates things, you know, you know, a million items in a list, I'm not going to write a test for a million items. That's just dumb. If it can cope with three, it can cope with a million. That's, that's, my, that's my assumption. So use chicken counting. Or counting. Also, use mocks and stubs. Use kind of ports and adapter patterns, hexagonal architecture patterns, so that you can kind of separate the concerns and you externalize or, or anything that kind of touches on, on something that, that can either slow you down or, or you're not really interested in, in the scope of the test. So you want, you're going to be able to evaluate the, 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 the interactions between, between your software. If you think about what testing is about, it's about... You need control. You need to control the variables and you need to put your software into, into a state in which you can accurately set it up into a condition that you, where you can evaluate things and then put a probe into it in some way so you can collect the results to evaluate them. And so that's why dependency injection and marks and stubs are so useful to be able to have those injection points that allow us to put something into the code that allows us to measure the results. So think about that. I, I, if anybody's following my, my YouTube uh, channel, I'm, a, I'm about to release a video on that topic next week, that measurement points in test driven development. So keep an eye on that on my YouTube channel if you're looking, look interested in that kind of thing. Culturally, behaviorally, a good idea if, if, you've got, if you find your test slowing down is to periodically sort your test by duration and then have a day or two where the team just focuses on speeding up the slowest tests. Um, and, you know, you just go through, sort them into order and just any test that's over two seconds, you can have a bash at trying to figure out how you can make it more efficient. And just spend, spend time, invest the time in, in doing that kind of thing. And it's a good discipline to get into to keep your build fast and efficient. Run the tests in parallel. If this is a problem for you, then what it's saying is that your test isolation is poor and you should fix that. Um, a, a, a test driven development style of test, a, you know, those sorts of unit tests, they shouldn't be leaking information and so they should they should be ultimately scalable you could e you could imagine the limiting case is how long it takes you to compile the slowest bit of code that you're going to evaluate and the duration of your longest test because you could run all of your tests in parallel on, se on a separate server if you really 
really went to town, you could imagine doing that kind of thing. So, so that's kind of the limiting case. Take this stuff seriously and think about how you design your tests to support parallel, parallel running. As a very last resort, you should try and avoid doing this, but if you really have a slow test that's problematic, but it's valuable to you for some reason, and you can't find a way of speeding it up, then consider moving that test out of the commit stage and putting it into a later stage in the deployment pipeline. This is a hack, but it's a hack that can be useful, particularly if you're, you're, trying, you're, you're, you know, you're in the game of, of moving you know, a, you know, a more traditional application or something like that towards continuous delivery. This can be a useful hack in, under those circumstances. The next thing that might be slow in your in your commit stage is the is the analysis tests. The static analysis can give really valuable feedback, but certain types of static analysis tools can be really slow. So one thing that's important, and this is true of all of the tests really, but they need to pay for themselves. We need to be we need to be running tests that are useful and are going to going to help us catch bugs that we wouldn't otherwise catch. If the analysis tools are not catching bugs or are not prevent, preventing commits that will, that will degrade the quality of the software, you've got to consider their utility and decide whether they're worth running or not. Java's, Java's lucky, I think, because Java has some excellent tools in this space. So things like find bugs and check style sort of linked style checkers for, for Java are really fast and efficient and give you, give you some good insight in, in your commit builds in terms of the, the quality of the code that you're committing. Again, as a last resort, it, it can be worthwhile thinking about moving longer running analysis suites out of the commit stage and putting them somewhere else. One of the ways to determine, this is true in general when thinking about moving slow things out of the commit stage, it's what's worth thinking about is how often is this thing likely to catch catch a defect if it's going to be catching defects that that are essential for you to achieve your 80 percent confidence before moving on then you've got a you've got a problem you've got to work really hard to figure out how to make this feedback fast enough if it's not doing that then it's it is a candidate for moving out if you can't find any other way of solving the problem As a last resort, give, give up and move analysis out of the pipeline altogether. As I say, it's got to pay for itself. It's got to be worthwhile. And the speed of feedback is more important than the thoroughness of feedback at some level. And I, I am test obsessed. On, on the projects that I work with, we're going to have massive test coverage usually and very thorough uh, analysis and also, but even so, there are points at which you say, I can't figure out how to do this kind of test. And so I've now got to seriously question the value of that that's bringing to me and think about that. The next bit that can be slow is uh, are, the, are, the, are the creation of the installers. Our objective, if you remember from the commit stage, is if the commit stage succeeds, we want to use the work that we've already done we're halfway to having a releasable thing because we've already compiled the code and so on. So we're going to then assemble the code into some releasable unit of software. And from then on, what we want to do is that we want to use that releasable thing to test the deployment of it, the configuration of it. And that thing should be the bits and bytes that ultimately we're going to put into production if this release candidate makes it that far. We want to test release candidates that were, you know, are candidates, genuine candidates to make it into production. The output of a successful commit stage is a production deployable is production deployable software. Now again, Java Java has an advantage here because the compilation's fast, the builds fast, and that that helps and all a great deal in some of these things. For other technologies, this can be difficult to achieve, more difficult to achieve. With Java, there's to be honest, little excuse. You can build jar files very quickly and you can even generate Docker images very quickly as part of your build process. 
However, if creating in storage is slow, this is a candidate for moving out of the commit stage because in reality, it's highly unlikely that you're going to into find a problem at the point at which you're just assembling things into a deployable package. If you're generating a jar file, that's not usually something that goes wrong very often. And so um, this is a candidate for moving out of the commit stage if you must in order to be able to optimize things. Um, the, where are we? I'm going to skip over. I'm going to skip over this a little bit fast. This is human continuous integration. It's about the disciplines that are around human CI. And we're aiming to keep our software in a releasable state. We want to wait for the commit build to finish. We don't go home to lunch or, in, or go to a meeting before we've finished. If we find a defect, we're going to fix or re commit a fix or revert that commit um, uh, within 10 minutes is a good discipline to adopt. If somebody's gone home, you revert their change on their, on their part. If you broke the build, that's a sin and you should be punished. You put a pound in a jar or wear a silly hat or something like that. And then you should be monitoring the progress through the pipeline as it goes on and so on. Um, continuous delivery is about optimizing the process to keep the software in a releasable state. That means the top pipeline failures, wherever they occur, are the top priority in the development process in this approach. So what I've talked about so far, the, the, the human CI is kind of based on this kind of fairly conventional model for continuous integration. Continuous delivery, the first stage is the commit stage is a continuous integration stage with just a little bit more added on in terms of the kind of evaluations we do and the generation of the, the release candidate into the artifact repository. But essentially it's continuous integration. There's a, there's, this is what I would term human conti continuous integration. You're going to commit to a version trial system and that's going to trigger the commit stage to run. There's another approach that, that, that may allow you to optimize this for larger teams or for teams that are not yet so familiar with CI disciplines and so on, where you, instead of committing to a version control system, logically you commit to the commit stage only if the commit passes are the ch those changes promoted to the version control system. That has the nice property that your version control system is always correct, at least to the degree to which the commit stage evaluates your changes. The slight downside with this approach is that it's a little bit more complicated to set up. It, it, it certainly with Git usually means playing with, with some weird branches and stuff like that for, for short, to, to manage the commit, the commit to the commit stage. And the, the, if, there, if for any weird reason there's a failure at the point at which you're merging the change into the source repository after it's passed the commit stage, that's quite a hard defect kind of problem to report unless people really know how, how all this stuff works. And it's just, it's there's quite a lot of plumbing going on here for, for people to understand that it's the only downside that I see to that strategy really. But that's a useful approach that's worth thinking about sometimes, gated, pre-commit, continuous integration. So in summary, um, the performance of the commit stage matters. It's really, really, really important that this is fast for, 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 for continuous delivery to work effectively. So teams with a com fast commit stage are able to keep the build green more than teams with a slow commit stage. So we're looking, if we're practicing continuous integration and continuous delivery is, continuous integration is part of continuous delivery, uh, then by definition, we should be committing to trunk, master, mainline, whatever you want to call it, at least once per day. And that means we're try, trying to optimize our many small commits. My preferred way of working in terms of committing is test room development. So I'm going to write a test, see it fail, write some code, see it pass, refactor them both, and then I'm going to commit them. So if I'm working well, I'm probably committing once every 10 or 15 minutes throughout the working day. So I want my build to be fast and my feedback to be efficient. Commit stage importance is important and it's worth investing time, money, effort into engineering. Think carefully about how to, how to get high performance at this stage. Next, the acceptance test stage. So what does this take? Uh, sorry, Dave, we have a couple of questions. And, sure. Uh, it's uh, one from uh, uh, James McGivern. 
what would you advise to a startup developing their MVP in terms of co-developing and the CD pipeline? Should the development of the automatic deployment be complete at the same time before or after? Uh, so so the, the, the best way of starting continuous delivery is on day one. So you write your first story so that, and make it deployable, whatever deployable means. So you might be, you know, you might be doing some really, really crude shell script or something like that in order to be to deploy that first thing, whatever that is. But it's a great way of starting, you know, to build your, infra your, your, your evaluation infrastructure, your testing infrastructure, your production infrastructure out step by step along the route. For, for startups and early stage projects, that is, that's very much the best way to start. So I would be building uh, an MVP, making it deployable and do, following this device. So my, uh, right at the start where I said my minimum deployment pipeline, that's exactly the kind of situation that I have in mind. Um, Ex-colleague of mine, Dan North, uh, talks about creating working skeletons as the first stages in, in, in kind of getting, getting your, your, your development team established and the, the technology established. And this is exactly what he's, he's talking about. So you want to build kind of a, a very, very thin slice through your architecture that kind of just does enough to stand something up, check you know, check that it works and, and so on to some degree. And you want to be able to do unit testing, acceptance testing and deployment to production, uh, you know, at that point with, with that walking skeleton, just to, just to evaluate. It's going to be really simple. It's going to, but that first story is going to be, it's probably, probably going to take the team, you know, you know, most of an iteration or something like, like that to do the for, first story and get all of these pieces in place. You know, to get to, to bootstrap the project. The second question is from Katie Sanderson that asks, uh, where do you think enforcement of code standards belongs? Uh, enforced automatically during the commit process, a step during the build also? Not yeah, I, so, I, I, so, so, so I, I think you run them as, uh, you, you, you best run them as part of the commit process. You want fast feedback on coding standards. So when, when, we, when we built our exchange, the part of the build was an eval, you know, we, we, we implemented our coding standards as, as a test in our commit stage so that it rejected changes. So if you, if you committed code with, I think it was more than six parameters or more than, more than 20 lines of code in a method, it would reject your change. Um, we, we had some team rules that allowed you to override that if you could convince somebody else that you were doing it for, for a good reason, but, um, but, but, but we built that in, that automation in. So I think it's a very good place to put it is in the commit stage. Okay, no other question. You can go on. Thank you. So the acceptance test stage, remember what we're looking for here is that we're trying to do these kind of, these orthogonal tests. We're looking at the software from a completely different perspective. Does the software do what the users want it to do? Is it useful? Is it, is it delivering value? Is it, is it configured correctly? Does it deploy correctly? Is it, you know, um, we're now deploying the releasable unit. You know, does, does the Docker image work? You know, all of those things. That's what we're interested in at this stage. In general, this is kind of the pattern for an acceptance test stage. We're going to configure the environment in some way. We're going to deploy the release candidate. We're going to smoke test it or health check to make sure it's up and running and ready for use. And then we're going to run acceptance tests, these whole system functional tests. Ideal, ideal feedback cycle for this and all of the rest of the stages really is under 45 minutes. I generally advise my clients, they look feedback from the commit stage in under five minutes, feedback from the whole pipeline in under an hour is, is what I usually advise. So we're probably gonna be running acceptance test stage in parallel with other forms of testing uh, to achieve that. But for this stage, we don't want the acceptance test going longer than, than much over 45 minutes, ideally, even for very large systems. So if acceptance tests um, uh, is, is slow, the first place where that could be slow is in configuring the environment. Um, this might, it's worth thinking about the rates of change for different layers, if that's the case. So if 
one part, you know, one layer of your system is very stable and changes infrequently, then maybe you, you don't have to, you don't have to deploy that every single time you release. So there are some patterns, you know, in, in terms of infrastructure as code. So there's um, config synchronization and, in, and immutable infrastructure. Immutable infrastructure is kind of the gold standard, the way that we would generally do things in the cloud these days. The downside with immutable infrastructure is you tend to be shipping more bytes around. And so under some circumstances, that can be slower. To be honest, this is a bit less of a problem if you're talking with modern technologies and, and deployment technologies like Docker, because it will look after some aspects of this problem on your behalf. Uh, but it's still worth thinking about if you've got a significant system or if you're applying this if you plan continuous delivery in a legacy environment. So if this is the case, it's worth thinking about layering the configuration. So let's divide the configuration up into layers and then you can kind of lay down those layers one at a time and you can, you can kind of check whether you need to lay down all of that layer before deployment. So you can, you can kind of think of this as kind of incremental deployment. Um, you can have these kind of pre-baked image templates. One of the one of my clients had a had a leg. We were migrating a legacy system to work within continuous integration, and they had some fairly complicated environments. So what we did is that we created a a bakery for the environments that kind of pre-configured all those environments and had a pool of them kind of queued up. So when it came time for you to deploy a new version of the code, you just take one of these things off the shelf. That would, those things were being generated in parallel by some other process, you know, elsewhere by some other process. So we could just kind of take one off the shelf and start from there. And that gave us, that gave us a big step up in the ability to go more quickly. Um, and of course, you can start thinking about using Docker. One of the, ni one of the nice things about Docker is it's kind of got this layered the um, uh, configuration management system inside it so it doesn't necessarily force you to ship all of the bytes when you deploy a, a new image uh, and that's that's handy that's 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 useful it's also worth considering this though if you're using for docker look for those really lightweight containers look for look for the things that are that are fewer bytes you're going to be shipping things around more more quickly and if, if they're lighter weight The next stage that might be the next part of acceptance testing that might be slow is the actual deployment. I worked with a, a, a big client for a large system and it took them four hours just to deploy their software into production, just to ship everything and get it up and running. Um, so successful deployment ends with a running system. And so all of the, the pieces and the moving the bytes around, getting it up and running, all of those things need to be in place. So for efficiency, we need to think about the time to actually ship those bytes around, the time to migrate any data that's used by the system to a new version, if that's part of the job of the system, and the time to start the system up and get it into a useful working state. And finally, the time to validate that it's ready for use, that it's good. So let's think about each of those. Time to deploy. The first thing to do is to keep the artifacts lean. I, I once worked with a client who they had a really big problem with really, really slow deploys. We did some analysis of what they were deploying and they were deploying 114 gigabytes of data um, every time they moved, they deployed their system anywhere. When we looked at that, 112 gigabytes was a big block of production test data that they were shipping around every time they deployed their software. It was simply insane. So we deleted the big block of production test data. Their deployment went down to st a still hefty um, four gigabytes, but that was better than, sorry, three gigabytes, but that was, that was a better situation to be in. So think about that. Think about how many bytes you're needing to ship around. 
Think about the packaging strategy by layering the packaging. That can be a useful tool that allows you, rather like the layer tracker when we were talking about laying down the infrastructure, you can think about deploying things uh, uh, differently. If you can package things separately, let's say we have a distributed service kind of architecture and we can start up the services, we can deploy the services independently of one another, we can start them all up in parallel and that's going to make our deployment much, much more e efficient. Um, the, the time to deploy itself, think about the network infrastructure constraints. There are times when that's an issue. If we ship, particularly if we're shipping large, large bunches of data around, but also if you're deploying to parts of the world where the infrastructure isn't, isn't as, as good as you're used to. Think about that kind of stuff and think about how long it's going to take you to move stuff around and, and start analyzing that as part of the, a part of the work to get this efficient. Minimize the data sets where you can. I dislike the use of production data in part for the reason that I've just mentioned. It can, it's just so huge to look around. I, I much prefer when testing to use synthesized data. Runtime generated data as part of the test cases is much, much my preference when, when acceptance testing. And, and so then you can be much leaner in the kind of data that you use. Consider better modularization and independently deployable services. I kind of mentioned that uh, ahead of time earlier on. Then we start thinking about the time to start up the system. You want to minimize startup dependencies. I, I have seen systems. <laughs> I worked with a client recently that in order to start the system, they ran the start script seven times because there were circular dependencies in the build. And it was only on the seventh time when everything was healthy. That's just insane, that's just crazy. So figure out the dependencies, figure out how you encode your services so that they, they're not gated on some other service. They don't require it to be running. Decouple those services, and not only do you then get faster architecture, sorry, faster startup times, you also get a better design as a result of that decoupling. So minimize those sorts of dependencies and ordering in, in, in the system. Invest in optimizing the code executed during startup. Make it really efficient. What we would really love is to be able to, these systems to, to, to be able to, to, to fail and restart really quickly. It's a really nice property of a, particularly complex systems, that they can restart quickly and get going again if there's, if there's a defect. It's a way of moving towards much more resilient systems if you're able to kind of you know, allow the system to fail and then restart it again. Think about better modularization, independently deployable services. The microservices approach is good, but you do have to take the, the dependencies between them seriously and not test them all together if you're going to go down that road. There's a common cycle when you start thinking about testing, the, the performance of testing in acceptance testing. Uh, teams start by writing, you know, you start off with your first few stories and you write a few acceptance tests and you run them all sequentially on, on maybe the same build machine as you, you're running your commit stage. And as the number of acceptance tests increases, the time that they take to deliver feedback starts to increase too. And so you have to stay on top of that. What usually happens is that the first step is to move those things off the unit test server and start running them in their own dedicated server. And when that gets too slow, what usually happens is that people will buy a second server and they'll manually divide the, team, the, the tests in half. What nearly everybody does that I've ever seen is that they, they, they run all of the tests with, from A to M, starting with A to M on, on one box and all the steps from M to Z on another box. And then they notice that one box always finishes before the other one and they start manually balancing the test to try and get the, fi the finish in the same time. Then they double up again. When those go too slow, they'll buy another two servers and they'll do that manually again. And now they're getting starting to get pissed off with all of the work that they're doing, trying to balance out those servers to make them run efficiently. At some point, they're going to start doing something more, more strategic and they're going to start parallelizing these things more efficiently. If you've, if you've taken the, the isolation of your acceptance test seriously from day one, this step of parallelizing things is trivially simple. You can just start throwing hardware at it 
and you can go incredibly fast. Um, the limiting case here, again, imagine, imagine we had infinite money and we could afford any number of servers. The limiting case in terms of the efficiency of feedback is how long does it take me to deploy my application or system and how long does it take me to run the slowest of my acceptance tests? Because I could imagine having a separate server, one server per acceptance test, deploy the application, run that test, and run them all in parallel. So that's the limiting case. And then after that, it's just a matter of how much money you've got and kind of optimizing between money and time. One of the things that nearly everybody starts thinking about if they can't get their tests running quickly enough is, is a strategy called test avoidance. And it's quite hard to do it well. I, I, I've tried, this is something that I confess I've tried several times and every time that I've tried it, when we measured it, we found that we spent more time trying to figure out which, which tests to run than we did if we just ran all the tests. So by default, I, my preference is just run all the tests. But there are people that do this at scale. Google do this with some degree of a clarity on massive scale. They'll, they'll, they'll do an analysis of which tests need to run given a certain change and then they'll just run those tests. But acceptance tests tend to be the tests that find things that you don't expect to see. And so you've got to be careful when, you're, when you pick and choose which ones you're going to run because it's easy to miss things if you get that wrong. As I said, if you, if you keep, kept your tests isolated, the scaling up stuff is relatively straightforward. We can kind of, when our acceptance test environment comes through, free, it goes and looks to the artifact repository for a release candidate, pulls that down, deploys it to an acceptance test environment, and then it's gonna spawn off a bunch of test hosts that are going to pummel the, ex, the, the release candidate in an acceptance test environment, cl collect the results and report back on them. And that's easy to do as long as you've done everything else. Here's a little GIF animation. So what usually happens is once you've scaled so far, you end up build, building something like a dynamic test allocator that will allocate your tests on a grid of compute to evaluate these things. This is the LMAX version of that piece of software which Mark Price, a colleague of mine wrote, and he did this lovely little um, animation to just visualize what's going on. So there's a bunch of tests running in parallel, there's a bunch of time-based tests that are running on dedicated servers, and you can, as you watch this, you can kind of see the tests being executed and servers being provisioned and, and, and rolled out, and it, the, the grid's kind of reconfiguring itself uh, as, it, as it progresses. Right, so failing tests. The efficiency of the feedback cycle is central to the ability of the team to keep the test green. So keeping these things fast is important. Um, I've, I've already talked about the five minutes and the hour long, the hour long kind of limits. So these are, these are remarkable. It's amazing the amount of work that you can do in these amounts of time if you take the importance of this feedback seriously. Google do this at ridiculous scale. Google runs somewhere between 150 and 200 million test cases per day. They run it, they have a single repository which has over a billion lines of code and they do trunk based development. This is, this is doable at massive scale, but you have to take it seriously. You've got to, you've got to think that you need that it matters and invest in the time, time and energy to make it uh, uh, work. Continuous delivery is about keeping the build in a releasable state. That means that a failing test tells you you're not allowed to release. So as soon as you identify a failing test, continuous delivery is demanding of you, you've got to commit a change to either revert that change that caused the breakage or to fix it. Next, intermittent tests. Intermittency is a serious pain and it's one that every team that starts taking this stuff seriously faces at some, some point along their journey. Um, what usually happens is for, for, for too long teams just live with the intermittency. I know that's happened to teams that I've worked on several times. It took me a long time to learn this lesson. Um, you just live with the intermittency uh, and it's a pain. What, so what does it matter? If, if 
what does it mean if you have an intermittent test? If a test runs and sometimes fail and sometimes passes, what an awful lot of people do is that they'll run the software again until it passes. There are many of the build management system, uh, Jenkins, Team City, those sorts of things, have a feature in them that allow you to say, if a test fails, fails, run it again and see if it passes. If that's the case, which one's lying to you? Is it lying to you when the test fails or is it lying to you when your test passes? The safest assumption is it's lying to you when it's passing. If the, int if the intermittency is there, there's a problem. And you need to kind of get on top of that. If the task, test passes once and fails once, it's a failure in my book. So we need to identify the intermittency. Don't live with intermittent, intermittent tests. Find a way to solve the problem. This can be expensive. This can take a lot of effort. And it's a pain in the neck, I confess. But it's important. Um, if you can't fix the intermittency in the tests, it's worth thinking about whether it's really worth keeping the test because it's lying to you. And so it's, it's muddying the waters. It's making it unclear what you should do. So it's worth considering at that point, dumping it. It's gotta be a really valuable test um, to be intermittent and worth keeping. Uh, and if it is that valuable, you've got to spend the time to figure out how to make it not intermittent. We got to the stage when we were building our exchange where we kind of eliminated this. So there's the kind of two, two common classes of intermittent tests. The most common intermittency is down to a bug in the test itself. There's something that you didn't do very well when you wrote the test. That's relatively easy to fix usually. And then there's the other kind. And once we, when we, when we were building our exchange, once we, once we'd found, once we largely eliminated that first group, the second group were incredibly difficult, but every time, every single time that I can remember that we identified one of those and we dug in, it was pointing to a real problem in the guts of our system. And so listen to those signals, treat them seriously. Software is deterministic and if it's not deterministic, there's something wrong with the design. So, so fix it and make it deterministic. Common causes of intermittency, race conditions, poor test isolation, poorly designed desk, test cases. And those are the three kind of, you know, the, the, the middle two are the ones that are relatively easy to fix. The race conditions and they, sometimes it's serious kind of things. Those are the ones that you want to know about. So take it seriously when you've got an intermittent test. Prioritize fixing the intermittent tests for sure. The last of my stages, uh, I'm, I'm slightly overrunning time, but it's not an awful lot more to go. We're just going to push through, push on through if that's okay with everybody. So the deployment pipeline is a strategic resource. It's our route to production. So consider service level agreements for your pipeline. Think about all of the things. If you're looking after a production system, this is a, this is a production system of a time. This is your production system. This is the system that allows you to produce software. So think about treating it seriously. I have worked in organizations where we built, we clustered our deployment pipelines. We, we treated them as highly available systems and had service level agreements and redundancy and failover and all of those sorts of things in our deployment pipelines. Take it seriously. The pipeline's a complex system in its own right. And so we need to treat it as such. Think about versioning it and your tools. One of the things that amused me for many years is that most of the build management systems that were on the market or, or, or open source uh, available were absolutely rubbish at being version controlled for a long time. Um, we want to version control it. We want to be able to recreate our deployment environments, our development environments, our test environments. We should be con configuration managing those and using infrastructure as code techniques to, to protect them. Consider writing test cases for some pipeline behaviors. I don't advocate doing full on test driven development necessarily for every change, but I have built a deployment pipeline for deployment pipelines in the past. I once worked in a trading organization with a team where we were doing kind of continuous delivery as a service for 
all of the rest of the development teams and we protected the deployment pipelines that were created with a deployment pipeline we even had a mini series of unit tests well we had a bunch of unit tests we did some testing development on infrastructure as code and we did um, acceptance testing with a fake pipeline to run automated tests on changes to the pipeline to make sure we hadn't broken anything and everything was version controlled so if we did break anything we could step back and make sure it was working think about blue green deployment strategies for pipeline changes so you can keep the pipeline up and running all of the time losing the pipeline even for short periods of time can be serious particularly in a big organization uh, and so it's worth thinking about applying the same kind of thinking that we do to our production environment to to our uh, to, to our development uh, systems too use infrastructure as code to for all to, for all pipeline hosts so that they're recreatable you can reproduce them on demand at the push of a button and these days if you can run all of this stuff in the cloud this is a very good job for the cloud so that, so that you get the scalability much more cheaply than we did in the old days when we used to do this on in our own data centers. Make the pipeline your only route to production. All changes to production, configuration changes, changes to the operating system version, update of Java, changes to the software, changes to its configuration, anything. Any change to production goes through the deployment pipeline. Then you can test it. Then you know whether it's going to, whether it's going to be good. The way that I see continuous delivery is that when you practice it at these kind of fairly extreme levels that I'm talking about, it becomes a competitive advantage for, for organizations. What we have when we build a sophisticated continuous delivery system is essentially an experimental platform that allows us to play with all of the technical changes to our production systems and ultimately if we start then gain, gathering the telemetry from our production systems too, We've got an experimental platform that goes all the way out to production and we've really then in kind of digital disruptive territory where we can, we can have an agile business and continuous delivery of ideas, not just continuous delivery of uh, as an automated deployment mechanism or whatever. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very, very much for putting up with me slightly overrunning. Um, happy to take any questions. I'm going to turn off the screen sharing so you can look at me. I'll point to you to look at my YouTube channel and uh, and, and, and link up on Twitter if you're if you're interested in that kind of thing. Uh, so I'm going to stop the screen sharing. Uh, stop the screen sharing, which is there. There we go. Good. So any questions? I can't hear anybody if anybody's talking. Uh, it's a question in, in the chat and uh, Anthony B ask uh, any favorite tools for visualization and reporting of complete pipeline executions? Um, there are several on the market. Uh, fav fav favorite would be a bit of a stretch. I, I think I've not seen the one that kind of for me is the killer killer tool. All of the deployment pipelines that I've built have been kind of ad hoc assemblies of tools. I should say that my view is that the ideas and the patterns and the philosophy is much, much, much more important than the tools. However, uh, in terms of the tools that are kind of better in this space, um, uh, ThoughtWorks Go, uh, which wasn't terribly successful as a, as a build management system, but it was built with the idea of pipelines from the ground up. They got some of the pipeline modeling wrong to my view. Everybody has, everybody's misunderstood what a pipeline is in the tools from my perspective, but I am a, I am a bit biased. Um, but Go is quite good. Um, in terms of just build management systems, the, I, I, Team City is pretty good and you can build pipelines out of it, but the, the visualization of those pipelines is pretty poor. Um, People speak highly of the um, of Spinnaker and, and the Armory people are doing some interesting stuff in terms of cloud builds and fairly sophisticated build systems. 
I'm not quite sure what the visibility of those sorts of pipelines looks like um, for complex systems. For simpler systems, many of the cloud providers, so Semaphore CI, Circle CI, those sorts of things are pretty nice, but none of them really give full end-to-end -end pipeline visibility to my mind. There's another class of tools in this space if you're kind of coming at this from a legacy, more legacy point of view. So things like the urban code tools and the Xebia labs tools that allow you to kind of build pipelines and automate more traditional bits of process, I think. Okay, we have another question that uh, uh, I don't get from Chris Melikan. Melikan. What's your preferred method for alerting people to broken builds? My, my preference is to have a big monitor with a big red blob and a big green blob at the end of the desk uh, where we're all working. Um, I dislike using email because the latency is too high. I can, I, I can carry on working and ignore my email. But if I've got a big red thing at the end of the desk, if I don't notice, somebody else is going to notice and they're going to come and tell me off. And that's good. I like that. So my preference is a big information radiator shouting at me that something's gone wrong. When I used to work for ThoughtWorks, we did some crazy things. There was one of the teams in India. They made they made a kind of, it was a cross between fireworks and a Christmas tree. And if the build broke, it kind of exploded with lights and noise. On, on another thing, we had lava lamps that were signaling between two different buildings that relative bills just just for a laugh but but i think the simplest thing you have a big monitor and you have a big red blob and a big green blob and then you can dig in and kind of find out what the detail is but for, you just want a really clear signal that whether it's good or bad it's another question from manny that uh, says what approach would you take if you went into organization or worked on a system where there is a cicd test cicd test coverage but they are not efficient best practice are not fully followed the scripts are not written idiomatically uh, duplication and not following convention uh, where would you start to improve and bring in, in improvement for the speed of delivery of, uh, of features what 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 you've just described in that question is kind of all of the my clients that i've ever worked with <laughs> pretty much so um so, so 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 where do you start under those circumstances so i think i think i think you can look at the things that i talked about we can look at optimizing parts of the build and those sorts of things to speed things up it really depends how bad the situation is uh, and so I, I i could give you a little bit of a war story so i i worked i worked for a trading company and one of their problems is they had a big c plus plus bill took nine and a half hours to do the build and run all the tests. So they just did an overnight build. Um, in the three years that they'd been operating that process, apparently they'd had two builds ever where, uh, where all the tests had passed. So what they did is that they picked, every morning they'd pick the, the modules where tests had passed and they'd allow those to be released into production and they'd discard the modules where tests had failed. This is a pretty high quality process compared to many organizations. But of course, if the modules where the tests had passed were depending on the modules where the tests had failed, stuff's still gonna screw up in production, and it did. We started working on this and, and stepping through it and improving it. So we started looking at the build and, and optimizing that. We did all sorts of crazy things. This was the organization where we, we threw hardware at it. We paid lots of money for, this, for some big, big powerful servers to, to parallelize the build and get lots of feedback. Um, and then we started digging into the tests. What I ended up doing was that I just, I just I, we got so far and we were, we were stuck. And so what I did at that point was I just did an analysis of all of the tests and I arbitrarily said, anything that runs under two seconds, I'm gonna count as a commit test. Anything that runs over two seconds, I'm gonna count as an acceptance test and move them out into those two different stages. That's a tactical hack. It's not a good plan, but it allowed me now to optimize for faster feedback. To put a very long story short, we managed to bring, build the cycle down from nine and a half hours with the build and the tests to a commit stage of 12 minutes. So not my five minutes, but closer. 
and an extent and the rest of the pipeline down to 40 minutes doing lots of parallelization and build optimization and some of the tricks that i talked about um, the acceptance tests were an ugly mess of complicated unit tests mostly um, the, ex the, the commit tests were an ugly mess of compli over complicated unit tests because they weren't done with tdd too but they were faster to run in the first two weeks after we made that change we had three builds where all of the tests passed. And in the following two week period and ever after, as long as why we, I was there, we had at least one build where all of the tests passed. So it was a bit of a tactical hack, but just speeding up the tactical hack was, was, was good enough as a first step. And then you start teaching people to do better tests and, and start working on the tests. And you know, it, all new code is done as test, test first, test during development. That's the most efficient way of writing these sorts of tests and so on. And then you can kind of start building, up, building yourself up into a different, uh, a better state. Okay, we have a, a, another four question. I don't know if we have time to copy everyone, but we see as many you can answer. From Zam, uh, when using multi-project build in Gradle, incremental build can get pretty slow when the dependency between projects is spiral out of control. Do you know any tools that help understand and optimize in the interdependencies between projects and the dependency graph? Uh, there are some tools, but I confess I can't remember. There are some tools that will do dependency graphing for you and tracing and, and, and you know, highlight where the dependencies are. Um, I, I think I think some of the some of the the, the general analysis tools, Coverity and uh, and those sorts of things, will will do some of that kind of thing. But um, but I think it, I think it's really about it's at that point. What you're really looking at is problems with your architecture. If you've got those sorts of if you've got those sorts of problems, what you need to, the the best way to fix it fix that is not a tool problem, it's a design problem. You've got to look to start improving the separation of concerns and, and modularity in your system to start to reduce those dependencies. I, ha I had a client, I have a client uh, that, that I've worked with for the past three years. Uh, when I started working with them, that, so they, they have a fairly large um, set of fairly complicated software. They build scientific instruments uh, and um, they they had to build them and when they started looking at it their, their build took four and a half hours when they started to build all of their software and they started digging in and what they found was lots and lots and lots of circular dependencies in the bill and it took them about six months to just start picking away at those and breaking them out and breaking the dependencies and the guy the poor guys that were doing it they were pulling their hair out as they were going through this but now they're in a situation where they can build their software in minutes instead of hours. And now they're in a situation, they've gone from not doing a software release in five years to being releasing reliably every three months. And they're, they're working, they're moving towards releasing every month now. So, so it's, it's, it's hard, ugly work sometimes to make this kind of change, but it's the kind of change that you have to make. Okay, it's another from Dave. Uh, do you see any specific challenges uh, and or opportunities related to continuous delivery and build pipelines arising from increased on working we are seeing due to lockdown? I don't know. So, 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 so if that's the Dave Hanslow that I know, Dave's, Dave's an old friend of mine, uh, so hi Dave. Um, but, um, but I uh, honestly no. So 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 my, so my work has been deeply affected, like everybody else's. So I'm still doing bits of consultancy and, and online things, but I'm I'm not doing the same kind of level of stuff that I was doing before. So I'm not seeing what people are doing uh, really uh, at the moment. That's about to change. People are starting to work work now on, online a bit more. But but I honestly I can't see how this is. Uh, I haven't been able to view what, how that has impacted people working this way. My guess, having done this in lots of organizations that were distributed and you know, distributed teams, is that the organizations that are good at continuous delivery are going to be better 
at sort of coping with this problem than organizations that are not because their builds are already going to be automated and they're all going to have already going to have all the tools and the channels in place to get feedback to developers so where you sit doesn't really matter very much in those sorts of organizations the the collaboration problems you know for years and years I, as, a, as an agile proponent i've been advising people to co-locate and now, now i'm saying stay where you are so it's it's a bit of a change in emphasis and, and i think that's probably more challenging than the, than the deployment pipeline stuff to my mind although i confess i'm not seeing this personally firsthand okay this is from uh, Sur suryan uh, how should incremental database changes be strung into pipeline? How do you see this fit in the pipeline? Databases uh, can be SQL or SQL time yep. series types. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. And, and um, so, so my first thing to say is that the data of your system is part of making it releasable. When I'm working on a system, I want the freedom to be able to learn something new and decide to change my data structures, whatever the data stores. And therefore, I need to work in a way that allows me to do that. So I need, so data's not alien to the pipeline, it's front and center, it's part of the pipeline. If I wanna achieve releasability. So I'm gonna do techniques like data migration techniques to, 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 to help me do that. There's a bunch of patterns I, I've got I've got a conference presentation on, on, on data migration techniques, but it's not been recorded yet, so I can't point you at it. I have a plan to go into this in more depth on my YouTube channel. So if you, I apologize for advertising my stuff, but if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, I do, do intend to do something on the various patterns of data migration techniques, but just to highlight a few very quickly, I'm not gonna go into, a lot of depth. Uh, so deployment time migration, working a series of deltas, write delta scripts, and then kind of have each of those have each, each of those have a, a sequence number. Uh, identify which you know which version the data store is at and which version a release candidate ne needs, and then your deployment tools can identify the gap between what's needed by this release candidate and what version the data store is at, and then it can apply the right delta migration scripts to e evolve the structure of the data. Um, unit tests the migration scripts to see whether they migrate the things that they say they're doing. And that's not enough. If you've got a large data set, that's too slow to do that deployment time. Then there are these other patterns. So you need things like lazy migration patterns and um, uh, 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 lazy reading patterns and these sorts of things to cope with all of these things, which all add significant extra complexity at runtime to the design of your system, but are necessary if you want to be able to do this kind of thing. Another question for, from, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this name, Wojciech Kepper, uh, apologies for my pronunciation, about the performance tests. He says JMH benchmark, custom uh, throughput, latency test and multi-process prod like environment. Any recommendation around two set and approaches to executing performance tests execution in a continuous manner? I, I am in a slightly strange position when it comes to talking about performance testing because the, the latter part, when I did a real job, when I wrote code for a living, um, um, my, the, the latter part of my career was spent in low latency finance. So performance testing was front and center, but esoteric because in those environments, we were measuring things to microseconds and nanoseconds of resolution. And so you can't buy any tools for that stuff. You have to write your own tools because all of the tools that you can get are too slow for that world. So I don't really have any up-to-date experience of performance testing tools. And yet I'm kind of an expert on performance testing systems at some level, uh, if you can, that kind of weird esoteric world. Um, there are a few things to point out. So if you are not building seriously high performance systems, then things like um, 
Um, oh damn, I think the name's gone from my head. One of one of my friends had a, had an open source project that would allow you to um, to to run things at load. So scaling scaling cases out using that are interesting. If you if you are running high performance systems, though, you're probably in the game of running custom test runners, particularly for component level performance testing. I would advise dividing performance testing into two different sections: component level and system level. Component level performance tests you are essentially performance unit tests. They're on components of the system that you know to be slow, and you measure throughput and latency at that level. And the trick there is to run the test before you write the code, before you test, put the test code in to check that the test is fast enough to be able to test the code. Um, and then system level performance tests are really to try and catch the things that you didn't think of in your component level performance testing, where you want to simulate higher level scenarios. I'm sorry, I can't say more than that on the tooling because I, I don't have any up to date experience. My experience of performance testing tools is well out of date. Just the last question and then we let, let you go and uh, thank you very much for your speech. You, you are oh, yeah. amazing. And uh, from John Foer, uh, why we don't have integration tests in the pipeline? And uh, is that because it's covered in the acceptance test? Yes. The simple answer is the acceptance test is kind of an integration test on steroids. So if we are, if the scope of our deployment is a is if the scope of our deployment pipeline is a deployable unit of software, then our acceptance test is evaluating that deployable unit, and so everything that is required to integrate together to achieve that deployable unit is within the scope of the acceptance tests. In general, as a general piece of advice, I think that there's no necessity to kind of build integration testing in as a strategic part of your testing strategy. Um, I think instead commit testing and acceptance testing is enough. However, there are times for efficiency and only for efficiency uh, where, where some forms of integration testing might be useful in allowing you to fail some kinds of problems more quickly. There's one caveat to that. If you're working in kind of a, a more distributed team and you kind of got a microservices architecture, then you don't want integration tests between services, but using contract-based testing is a useful strategy to kind of isolate those, the, the services from one another and validate that the interfaces between them aren't changing, which is kind of a different take on integration testing in a way, I suppose. Okay, thank you, Dan, and uh, I think that it's, uh, it's enough. <laughs> Your speech is, was great, and uh, thank you for everything, and hope that, uh, I, I, I think that I subscribe your channel, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thanks to everybody. Thank, thank you very much for, taking, for listening today.